Welcome to Let the Qur'an Speak. I'm Aisha, your host. Many people criticize the Qur'an for talking about war, but even when war is discussed in the Qur'an, it is in accordance with principles outlined in Just War Theory, minimizing harm as much as possible. Today, we will continue our series on Just War Theory. Let's sit down with Dr. Shabir Ali to learn more about how the Qur'an stipulates guidelines within a war. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shabir. Pleasure to be on. So we're uh, on the third part of Just War Theory, and now we're talking about guidelines um, in war. So what does that entail? Well, uh, justice within war uh, usually is described as involving two main principles. One is uh, non-combatant immunity, and two, proportionality, which we came across before, but we'll deal with it again uh, as, as part of justice within within war. So let's focus on non-combatant immunity. What, what does that entail and what does it mean? Well, it, it, it is also called the principle of discrimination, but of course the word okay. discrimination nowadays means many things. Yeah. But when it was first uh, used in, in this discussion, it meant discriminating between uh, combatants and non-combatants. You can target uh, combatants, uh, the fighters from the other side, but you cannot deliberately target uh, civilians. And now, of course, uh, in, in many wars, uh, civilian casualties result. Uh, often as a, what people call collateral damage, uh, something that is not actually intended, but uh, it's sometimes unavoidable, and we wish that this would not be there, but sometimes it so happens. But to deliberately target civilians, this is uh, one of the obvious signs that the war is not being conducted in a just manner. So how does this factor in with what we're seeing, um, you know, with the recent Paris attacks and Bernardino? Well, both of these obviously fall outside of the just war principles, that that would be quite unjust to deliberately target civilians. Uh, as you know, uh, the uh, definition of terrorism is not uh, fully agreed on, but one of the core items in, in identifying terrorist acts is that uh, terrorist acts uh, are usually uh, conducted uh, targeting civilians for political causes. Uh, usually the terrorists uh, do not feel they have enough power to uh, deal with uh, the army of the other side, or if they deal with the army, uh, they may attack using guerrilla tactics, uh, attack and then go back into hiding, attack, go back into hiding. Uh, but uh, attacking civilians just takes it uh, to a whole new level. It's no longer attacking combatants, it's attacking uh, civilians. Um, and, and usually the message is, look, we will kill your civilians unless you do ABC. Uh, and, and sometimes in modern times it, it, it might even appear that the terrorists don't even have a, a particular uh, agenda uh, or a particular demand uh, or the demand may be so big and vague that nobody's going to respond to that demand. There's, there's nothing specific t for you to do and, and the terrorists are just responding by killing civilians from the other side as if there is a perpetual war uh, and, and the war now involves the civilians of the, of the others. So, so what would you say to someone who might argue that, uh, you know, the West attacks uh, innocent civilians through their own, uh, you know, maybe they're trying to target a specific terrorist group, but they end up killing a lot of civilians. And so this is, you know, someone else's um, version of fighting back. So one innocent life in the Middle East for another innocent life in the West. How do you, I, and I know obviously they're all innocent civilians, how do you, wh what would you say to that? Definitely uh, lives are worth the same, whether in Beirut or in Paris, uh, whether in uh, the Middle East or, or uh, the, in one of the Western countries. Uh, and civilians should never be deliberately targeted. And uh, even when the civilians are not targeted, but deaths result from uh, uh, actions which were done with uh, legitimate military objectives, uh, the, one has to step back and look at our actions and see, you know, what, what that's the recausing. For example, if a drone strike was intended to take out a terrorist target, but uh, at the same time uh, many civilians were killed in that uh, attack, we have to ask whether it is, uh, th this is a justifiable uh, use of force, even within a just war. Uh, but, but we can never equate the two. We cannot say that because they killed co uh, civilians uh, as a matter of collateral damage, we can now target their civilians. Targeting civilians is highly immoral, and to do that uh, is, is not justifiable. And to equate the two types of killings is, is really morally skewered, because the, the two are not the same. There, there's a lot of difference between uh, killing somebody unintentionally and killing somebody intentionally. 
So uh, a lot of the civilian d deaths that are occurring in, in modern warfare uh, are, are unintentional civilian deaths. And, and what the terrorists do are often intentionally killing civilians. There's a lot of difference between the two. And are there any specific verses um, in the Quran that deal uh, specifically with this topic? Yes, uh, several verses. For example, in the second chapter of the Quran, in the 190th verse, it says, fight in the way of God uh, against those who are fighting uh, uh, against you. The best way of putting that is to say, fighting against, uh, fight in the way of God against those who are attacking you. And then the verse continues by saying, uh, and do not transgress limits. Certainly God does not like the transgressors. So if somebody's doing something to please God, and he thinks he's fighting a battle on behalf of Islam for the pleasure of God, uh, he can only uh, uh, target the people who are attacking us, but not... In, and in that's physically in war, yeah, on that's war right. grounds, it's right? Within, it's within the war. It's not like outside of war. If, if, there were, if there was a war and the war, now we have a peace treaty, you cannot go after the soldiers of the other side now because they once attacked you, because once you have a treaty, that no longer applies. So it's really within the battle context. It's, it cannot be taken outside, and definitely you cannot attack civilians because the civilians are not attacking you. Uh, in, in the 16th chapter of the Quran, we have a, a very telling verse, the 126th uh, verse, which says that if you seek revenge, then take revenge to the extent of the harm that has been done to you. But if you are patient, then certainly this is better uh, for those who know what it is to be patient. So uh, the, the you can only go to that extent. Now there is a story behind this verse. It is widely reported in the traditional commentaries on the Quran that uh, Hind, one of the non-Muslim uh, women at the time, uh, had uh, hired a man to kill the uncle of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in, in what would have been the upcoming battle, and that b battle was the Battle of Uhud. Hamza was killed. And, um, in the battle? In the battle, uh, killed by this man, Wahshi, who was hired by the other. So, and, and this lady eventually came to the battlefield and uh, mutilated the body of the Prophet's uncle, uh, and, and some reports even say that she took out his uh, liver and, and chewed it. So savage uh, was she at that time. Um, uh, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, was quite distressed by this. And he and, and many of the Muslims uh, vowed that if we have the upper hand over them uh, in the future, uh, we will mutilate like 70 of their dead. Uh, but uh, uh, this verse uh, is said to have now come down as a caution to the Prophet, peace be upon him, a revelation from God and instructing the Prophet that, that he cannot uh, take revenge beyond what has been done to him, but if he forgives, this is better. And then it is said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, announced that he has chosen the path of forgiveness, so that when he eventually marched into Mecca, the hometown of Hind, this lady who had chewed his uncle's uh, liver, he declared amnesty for one and all. And uh, he, uh, rather than taking revenge, he said, I forgive you. And I say the same thing which Joseph said to his brothers, I forgive you. So the, it, it's, it's, n it's not a matter that uh, we can transgress limits. It's not, not even a question. We, we're not allowed to do that. Um, the 42nd chapter of the Quran called the Shura, uh, the consultation, in the 40th verse says something similar, uh, that, that the, the reward of, uh, or the repayment for an evil act is an evil act like unto it. It's called by the same word, even though obviously it'll have a different uh, flavor because uh, it is actually done in retaliation. Uh, but uh, again, the caution is that uh, y it's only up to that extent. And if you forgive, then this is better. If you forgive and you reconcile, then this is better according so to that's that verse. And it's clear that forgiveness and being patient is more powerful and more rewarding than actually going into war. Exactly. I mean, the, the whole purpose of the war w in the first place was to right wrongs and, and uh, get rid of oppressive behavior uh, and persecution. And uh, the best way of winning over your persecutors is actually through kindness. Many other verses of the Quran speak about that. So if uh, people take into their, uh, the law into their own hands and they think, okay, I'm going to seek redress for the wrongs done to Muslims by killing civilians of the other side. Well, uh, first of all, you're going against the Islamic dictates here. You're going against the Quran. And secondly, your actions are bound to uh, rebound uh, against the Muslims, uh, and this is what we're seeing happening after the Paris attacks, after the San Bernardino attacks. And it looks like the terrorists never learn because uh, uh, we've been seeing this from 9-11 all the way down. Constant. None of these terrorist acts have actually come back to benefit Muslims, but each one has brought great harm 
uh, to Muslims and to the image of Islam. So briefly, um, focusing on the other principles of proportionality, I know we talked about it previously before going into war, but how does this uh, factor in when you're in war? Well, within the war itself, it, why it is described again between within the war is that uh, y you can have uh, a, a war that started out with just principles, like right from the beginning you had the idea of proportionality as an example. Um, so you started off the war with good principles, but then within the war you might have lost that. Uh, and lost that focus. So within the war as well, we are reminded that you have to abide by the principle of proportionality. You cannot, uh, for example, start using nuclear weapons because this will be immoral. The, the, the amount of deaths and destruction that would result from the use of nuclear weapons just uh, simply renders it unusable in modern times. And uh, obviously we should be calling for the um, destockpiling of, of nuclear weapons worldwide, Disarm nuclear disarmament, uh, Th that should be a Muslim thing to call for. Um, but but uh, sticking to our present discussion within the war, you cannot uh, use unjust means for uh, achieving the good purpose of uh, ending the war or, or righting a wrong. So remember your intention about why you actually went into war to begin with. Exactly, and continuing to uh, abide by the principles of uh, non-combatant immunity and proportionality. Thank you very much, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome. Hey YouTube, we hope you benefited from this video. If you liked it, or if you didn't, let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of our other videos. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.